really a nip in the hair, but you know, August is here and you get the first kind of like hint of uh, the impending fall. exercising or walking and then you switch the car in reverse right and then they're like <laughs> they suddenly break into a trot gold <laughs> made you look made you look made you buy a penny book <laughs> did you ever see those tin tables that look like they're like they're wood that's what I thought that thing was Stop the car, get out of the car. 
I waste? Oh, there's something. So sometimes, even to a trained eye like me, you know, I'm only giving it a nanosecond of a decision time to stop or not. <clears throat> now you make that decision to stop, and it turns out to be shiznit. Okay, this has already been picked through. That cord has been stripped. But we are taking we're taking the scrap remnants anyway. I am burning fuel. I need to at least make it a a net a net zero. If I can't gain, I hate the seatbelt arrangement on these things. <coughs> I end up sitting on the buckle, okay, because with any car, and that's any car Mercedes Benz, Rolls Royce. General Motors product. Anything you use this, if you use the seat belt quite often, the the return spring, you know, the thing that coils it back up, doesn't work so well anymore, and that's because a lot of dust and and uh, lint and fuzz get in there, and if you don't clean it out. back up right I know I could add that I could add that to the list of million billion zillion things I need to do you know what I have to be honest there is not enough hours minutes days seconds left in my life to take care of every little something that needs to be taken care of can't, there's just not enough time to get around to it. Oh, come on, Kingdom, you're lazy. No, really, if you think about it, okay. <coughs> what do I got? Like 40 years left on this planet? Maybe? That's that's on the, that's on the upside? <laughs> I mean, I could be dead tomorrow, or 10 minutes from now, but my point is there's not enough time left on the planet. Life is short. So my philosophy is, I know, it's not, it's not applicable, it doesn't apply to everybody, it won't work for everybody, but for me, uh, I think it's better if I put my energies towards just trying to survive and fixing a seatbelt recoil um, unless I have all the tools at, right there at hand like a cartoon character I'm not going to do it it ain't gonna happen I have to learn how to live with things that are broken that still kind of work a little bit but for the you know I don't know I think I said it before, that would be a, a cool channel, like, you know, like learning to live with things like on the channel and still make them work, and the things on the, on the channel that are being used, some of them could be nearly 100% broken, but they're still somehow or another being put to use. I don't care if it's like a scissors or I don't know, a screwdriver or maybe an electric drill that only goes one direction, you know, it doesn't have, maybe it's only got reverse, maybe it's only got kingdom. Using stuff like that is unproductive and consumes more time, the same time that you're trying to save. Well, here, here's the freakonomics about this. What about the amount of time required to earn the money to go and buy a brand new replacement one which is probably made in China and is probably not going to last very long. Well, that's solvable kingdom. Buy something American made. Well, if you can, great. But then, of course, it usually costs twice as much, if not more. So, 
the, all the productivity that you need to consume to direct that way to buying the new device which could get broken, lost, stolen, or definitely will wear out also over time. Why not make the most use out of something that you found for free? Okay, so no productivity was expended in acquiring the device other than the time that it took you to find it in the first place. So my claim is, living with it broken is actually, in the end, you're a couple of steps ahead. That's just my claim. I could be disproven. I will have people arguing counterpoints otherwise, and I understand that.
some of them out because a lot of those people seem so much better at explaining their condition than than I ever could. But a lot of people with my condition cannot keep a job or simply don't have a job because they can't function in the workplace. The workplace is overwhelming or they have trouble multitasking, which I really do. I struggle with it. So, a lot of us types find ourselves unemployed, and that would be me. I've had, God, I've had like, I don't know, probably about 200 different jobs in my lifetime working for other people. All right, never totally given up. Okay, I, I still, even though I'm scrapping, I've never totally closed the idea of working for another person. <clears throat> but every time I do, I try different levels of hard, okay? I try really hard. I try mediocre hard to perform, you know, well and not make a mistake. I lay back a little bit and I don't think about it so hard. Don't try so hard. It's like, no matter which way you turn the dial, <coughs> it doesn't make a difference. You know, and then people are like, you're a very intelligent man. And trust me, that's not what the, that's not what the employer is looking for. He's not, he's not looking for Einstein. He's looking for a worker. He's looking for somebody that can receive commands and execute the commands as given and perform the task as stated and, you know, and, and be able to figure out all the nuances that go along with the task, both, <coughs> both physically, you know, and uh, socially and mentally. So I find myself doing uh, something like this, finding garbage, okay? I'm going up and down the street. You know what I used to do? I had a newspaper route, and I actually somehow or another managed to keep that stupid job for about five years. But man, if I wasn't always in trouble or something, as simple as delivering the newspapers, because... <coughs> I know, I'm a man of a million excuses, but I have dyslexia, and anybody that has any idea about dyslexia, you could look at a number like that, like 1420, what's so hard about that, they give you a sheet of paper with the list of the newspaper that needs to be delivered to that house on that particular day, okay? Well... I would deliver it to maybe instead of 1420, I would deliver it to 1402. Okay. And on top of that, I wasn't delivering one brand of newspaper, I was delivering six different brands of newspapers. So oftentimes the wrong address um, inverted, okay, would get the wrong newspaper. So it was like wrong all the way around. And you know, the guy tried working with me nine ways to Sunday. Sometimes he'd have the wife help me, um, his wife help me roll the newspapers, you know, put them in plastic bags, because that's what they do. They don't use rubber bands, you stick it in a plastic bag, and, you know, that protects it from the elements, etc. <coughs> The newspaper delivery job was prime because I was out in the early morning before the scrappers even and I was finding scrap too because I'd be delivering with my truck and I'd find a water heater and you know I'd deliver hey you know pick that up and uh, so that's that's why I have trouble. That's 
one of the reasons why I have trouble functioning in this society. I find functioning in society extraordinarily draining. Something that's seemingly, it's, it, it appears as if it's easy for people. Like, what's so hard about getting up in the morning and going to work and, you know, punching the clock and taking your two breaks and eating lunch while there's also socializing with uh, fellow employees and not saying the wrong thing and, uh, you know, you know, and when you're talking to um, <laughs> a female co-worker, you know, knowing where to, like, knowing where to put your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> or or not to or I'm, I'm just giving examples or knowing how to look people in the eye I can't do that I cannot look somebody in the eye and people take that as somebody that's shady or um, like kind of uh, shiftless You got something to hide, or you know what I mean, or arrogant. I'm trying to think of all the different kind of things that I was like called, you know, like, uh, oh, you appear, uh, you appear a little shady there, or why are you acting shy? What shy? No, three. Oh, I don't, I don't look. I can't look at you in the eye. I just. I can't do it. People are on you know, my channel. What? You can't look? You're making this up. No, I don't want to look you in the eye. I don't want to do it. I just don't want to do it. I, I have to force myself to do that. And at that, you know, I can only do it for like a couple of seconds. And I got to look at the wall, at the ground, at the ceiling. And then it seems like when you're doing that, I thought about this, it seems like you're arrogant. Um, the person you're talking to is like, oh, wow. Um, oh, I'm sorry to waste your time. I'm sure you have more important things to do. And that's not at all what's going on. I, I feel feel too uncomfortable like I don't know I it's just one of, it's it's an Aspergian thing you know <clears throat> it's true of uh, people that uh, have autism they can't look you in the eye at all okay period that, that would be quite rare I mean my younger daughter has what's known as selective mutism and that's she will it's pretty much exactly what it what it states she will talk to only certain people and once once something has clicked in her head and I've asked her before a million times and she can't really put a, a finger on it but when she meets somebody at that nanosecond she makes the decision whether she can talk to that person or not and you know what if she makes the decision in her head that she's too uncomfortable talking to that person, she probably never will talk to you, ever. Her one dance instructor, she's never talked to. And she's been taking dance lessons from her for seven years. And she's never said one word to her directly. She has to have somebody else interpret for her what she wants and stuff like that. I've explained this before to people and they find it incredibly hard to believe. Now, well, here's some shiznit scrap right here.
you know that feeling you get like when you think you're about to pull a muscle and then at the last second when you're about to throw something and it's like hold your fire well that's pretty much what just happened right there Talk to you later.